We're doing it old school today. Thank you very much for joining me here on Dulce America with Bing Futch. I'm Bing Futch, your host, and today we're going to be talking about playing with the noter. It's a very traditional style of playing using a piece of wood, a wooden dowel. It could be any shape, any size, and we'll talk more about how to put all that stuff together uh, so you can work with it. Now, technically speaking, if we were really truly going old school, I'd have a noter in my left hand and I would have a quill a feather in my right hand. I can't think of the last time I actually had a turkey feather in here that I was using. So if anybody out there has any quills, send them my direction because I would love to be able to show people how this instrument was played back in the day. But today I'm using a pick, but a lot of people still like using the noter. One, because they like that slippy, slidey sound you get. The sound of the wood going across the metal strings. Also, some people have a hard time using their fingers. Maybe their fingers are too sensitive, or um, maybe the strings are really old and covered with all kinds of stuff. In fact, Kendra Ward told me that when her father used to play on the family farm there in Bidwell, Ohio, that he would take the noter at the end of a very long day, sit down, and before he played, he'd take the noter and rub it across all three strings and slide it back and forth like this to get all of the built-up rust and grime and crud and everything else off of there so he could play and the strings would sound pretty good. Now, hopefully you're changing your strings a lot more often, uh, but the thing is, is that people still like to use this for a lot of other reasons besides simply playing traditionally. So if you're in either of those camps, today I'll show you a little bit about playing with the noter. So first of all, about what size should your noter be? This is a very, very uh, simple and very skinny noter. It doesn't have any tapering on it whatsoever. As you can see, it's, uh, it's a stick, and you can see the circumference of that noter right there. Now, this is pretty long. A lot of noters are actually not even that big. But I like this one. It's long because uh, I can reach across to the other strings and still have a good amount of it in my hand and then make it across that way. So a lot of it's going to be aesthetics to you, how big your hand is, whether or not you wanna play simply on the melody string or play on the other strings as well. Now, as far as how big around it should be, again, this comes down to being comfortable. If you had a big, really wide piece of wood, obviously this wouldn't feel uh, very comfortable in your hand. You wanna be able to curl your fingers around it and have a pretty nice but relaxed grip on that thing as you're moving it back and forth. Also, the thinner it is, the uh, better able you're able to look down and see uh, the, the frets and the strings and where you want to go. A large, wide noter might make that difficult. One more thing is you want to make sure that it is round. Now, you can use a flat noter, uh, but what's going to happen sometimes is while you're handling this and moving it up and down, the noter is automatically going to kind of turn in your hand. With a round noter, you're always gonna have a surface that you can work with. With a flat noter, you're gonna find yourself sometimes working with the edge, but then again, that might be helpful to how you wanna play the instrument. So, you know, anything goes as far as what type of wood you use. Hardwoods are gonna be the best because they conduct the sound a lot better, and after playing it a lot, you won't end up cutting down deep these notches into the noter. So a hard wood's gonna work a lot better than a soft wood where you'll get those tracks on there. But then a lot of people like to have those tracks cut in there because then they can just kind of lay the tracks, the ruts of the strings in the noter on top of the strings and not worry about them slipping back and forth. So the thing I like about the mountain dulcimer is that anything goes. You can approach it exactly how you want to approach it. So here's my skinny noter. It is round. And uh, let's talk about how to hold it. There are two basic holds. There's an over-the-top hold, and then there is an underhanded hold. So a couple of things. First of all, let's talk about this underhanded hold. And this is what I like to do, basically. I've got my thumb on top of the noter, and then the rest of it is just kind of laying in my outstretched hand. So I'm going to close my fingers around it, get the thumb on the top, and I've got enough noter out to pretty much reach all the way across the fretboard. The rest of it is inside of my hand. So with my thumb on top, it is my thumb that is going to be applying the pressure as I move from fret to fret. 
like this. I can also reach over and hit the middle string and hit the bass string if I want to. The thing about this underhanded method is that your knuckles, depending on the height of your fretboard, can brush against the top of your instrument. Now, if you have a teardrop instrument, that's not going to make any difference because there's not going to be anything here. But there will be some here as you get higher and higher up the fretboard. So you might have a bit of knuckle dragging going on there on top of your soundboard with this underhanded approach. But if you keep that elevated, and you'll see the angle of this is changing. Instead of me kind of coming at the noter where it's actually dipping down at an angle away from the fretboard, I'm actually going the other direction to where I'm not going straight across, but actually elevating a little bit, because really all I'm using to contact the string is the very tip of that noter. And it doesn't matter how much I tilt it one way or the other, it's still going to be in contact with that string. So again, it's a matter of personal preference there. So there's the underhand method. The other method is overhand, and that's going to involve you simply doing this exact same thing, but turning your hand over so that the knuckles are facing up, and then using your index finger to apply pressure to the noter and bring it down on the string. A lot of people really enjoy this method because it's a lot like playing with your finger because your finger is pointing. So you can aim your finger at where you want to go, and instead of your finger actually making contact with the strings, the noter is doing the work for you. A lot of people feel a lot more confident with this method, and you don't have as much going on down here that's going to touch the top of the fretboard or on the top of the soundboard. So again, depending on the size of your hands, the size of your noter, and um, just how you feel comfortable playing the instrument. Those are two styles. Now, there are other styles. You know, some people will hold it like this. Some people will hold it like this, which I think is really awkward because then that tucks your elbow up under here. So experiment with it and find a grap. Grap? Find a grasp that's going to work for you, a grip that's going to work for you. That's what it was. Grip and grasp is a grap. <laughs> okay. So for the duration of this uh, episode, I'm going to uh, use the underhand method and play like this. So um, as far as uh, contact making with the string, if you're just playing on the melody string and you use the same pressure that you do if you're using your fingers, and you go to the left of the fret, you should get a real nice sound. If you don't push down hard enough, you will get some buzzing, which is not very attractive. If you push down too hard, you'll still get a tone, but you're really going to be working a lot harder than you have to, and you'll probably notch up your dulcimer uh, uh, noter quite hard, and also you'll go sharp because you're really pressing down on those strings hard, stretching them out a little more than they were intended to be stretched, and that will make your notes go sharp. Um, but if you're playing against the drone, they won't be as noticeable as if this thing were happening if you were playing chords and pressing down hard on the strings. Now, style of play. You can certainly take the noter and hop and skip around. But part of the fun of playing with a noter is just leaving that sucker down there on the strings and sliding back and forth to get that characteristic sound uh, that we associate with the mountain dulcimer. And the more you work at it, you can get really pretty quick with these things. All right, so um, let's uh, show you a couple of exercises here for moving up and down the fretboard and uh, trying some things. Some people like to just simply keep it pretty mellow, you know?
some wild wood flower there for you with the note or playing. But um, you can get lickety split with this thing and do all kinds of real fancy stuff. So um, I'm going to teach you Soldier's Joy using the noter, and this doesn't involve any chords or anything like that. Um, but I'll play it once, and I'll kind of play some of the extra stuff and then show you an exercise that you can use to um, play quicker up and down the string. So this is Soldier's Joy. So a lot of those quick changes, the back and forth, all that stuff right there um, can be a little fancy for a lot of folks and very too quick for a lot of folks. But if you want to work on that sort of thing, here's a little exercise I've come up with for moving in the first octave, which is going to be open through the seventh fret. And basically, it's working with neighbor frets, neighboring frets. So for example, if we start playing at seven, neighboring fret. Uh, heading lower in pitch would be the six and a half. And those are neighboring, they're right next to each other. And if I were to start at six and a half, my neighboring fret would be the sixth fret. But since we're thinking about being in the key, we'd actually want to go from six and a half down to the fifth fret down here to B. And then B to A, five to four and then B, uh, sorry, that A down to G, four to three. G to F sharp, three to two. F sharp to E, two to one. I got a one and a half fret, and um, not naturally, normally, that would not be in the key that we're playing. We're in the key of D, and that's an F natural, so the neighboring fret for the exercise is going to be from two to one. And then you will pack up or pick up the noter when you go from 1 to 0, from E to D. So working from the top 7 of the octave down to the bottom of the octave and open, you would simply do this. again. And just kind of get used to targeting what fret you're going to be heading to next. And get used to aiming your noter, the end of your noter, to those locations as you're moving up and down the fretboard. Then try doing a little pickup. Go seven, six and a half, seven, and then let go of it and strum open and then go to your next fret down and do the exact same thing six and a half to five back up and then take the noter off sorry And while you do that, you'll gain experience with moving the noter all up and down the fretboard, keeping it down on the strings, and then also taking it off the string. Sometimes you just aren't going to want to go sliding all the way from the first fret up to the tenth fret. So you'll want to go, you know. There are times when you're really going to want to hunt, seek, and then place the noter where you want to go. Now when you're doing that, you are going to pick the noter up off the string if you're going to hop a great distance. And then you can just simply put it down again.
All right, so um, a couple of exercises for you to work on there. You'll also be training your muscle memory and you'll learn how to aim. And if, you're, if your brain thinks we're heading to the third fret, your muscle memory will automatically put uh, your hand and the noter exactly where it needs to be. The more you work with that. So let's do Soldier's Joy. I'm going to start off with 4-5-4. Four, 4-5-4-2-1. Five, four. Four, five, four, two, open, 2-4-7-7. Two, seven, seven. Oh, I am my mother's darling boy. Let's go ahead and try that. Five, four, four, five, four, two, oh, two, four, seven, seven. And we'll play that a couple of times over. Notice I am uh, picking up my uh, noter a couple of times here. I'm leaving it down for this and this. Then I pick it up for the open. I come back down and then slide up to seven. Four, five, four, two, oh, two, four, seven, seven. Then, four, five, four, two, oh, two, one. Is the reply to that phrase. Then we do this again. Four, five, four, two, oh, two, four, seven, seven. Then, seven, eight, nine, nine. And here's one of those moves we, we rehearsed a little bit earlier on. Eight, nine, eight, seven, seven, seven. Again, that last section is seven, eight, nine, nine, eight, nine, eight, seven, seven, seven. That's the A part. So we'll do the A part again here. Let's do that one more time. I just love that little whistling sound that you get with that wood going across, and it really happens right when you cross over the fret. Hear that little sneak? That's the official word for that. The term for that is sneak. All right, let's go on to the B part. The B part now is going to be very, very simple. We're gonna go two, three, four. One, two, three. Two, three, four. Two, one is the tag on that. That's the first half of the B part. Let's do that again. Two, three, four. One, two, three. Two, three, four, two, one. The second half of this phrase would be two, three, four. One, two, three. Two, two, one, two, one. Open. And there's some more of that back and forth neighboring fret stuff that we did before. So again, that second half of the phrase, two, three, four, one, two, three, two, two, one, two, one, oh, oh, oh. And the whole B part. Sorry. And one more time. Two, three, four. One, two, three. Two, three, four, two, one. Two, three, four. One, two, three. Two, two, one, two, one. Oh, oh, oh. And that's all the B part right there. 
Let's put both parts together, A part and B part, for Soldier's Joy played with a noter. Here we go. Four, five, four, two, oh, two, four, seven, seven. Four, five, four, two, oh, two, one. Four, five, four, two, oh, two, four, seven, 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 eight, nine, nine, eight, nine, eight, seven, 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 and then repeat the A part. Now for the B part, starting at the second fret. Two, three, four. One, two, three. Two, three, four, two, one. Two, three, four. One, two, three. Two, two, one, two, one. O, O, O. Repeat this again. And that is the A part and the B part for Soldier's Joy, two times through the A and two times through the B part. Now, let's give me a, uh, I'll give you a little tip here on how to uh, use your right hand when playing not only with a noter, but when you're playing with fingers as well. Um, it's one strum per melody note, as we've been doing this whole time. And this has got a built-in rhythm that is derived from the melody. da 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 But you'll notice a few times that everything comes to a halt because we're holding on to a note for a long period of time. Right there, we're holding on to that note for a little bit, and because we do, and we're not hitting that note again, the rhythm just kind of comes to a stop. And if you want to make this real groovy, you need to do a little extra something. And what I tend to throw on the end of measures that have notes like this, and bear in mind that at the end of that uh, measure where that is, there's going to be a pickup note or a couple of pickup notes that do this. So usually if I'm playing something like a half note, something lasting about two beats is where I like to put in a little extra something because two beats is too long to wait around for some groove to pop in for somebody who wants to dance to it. So I put in a couple of extra eighth notes but I throw them in on the bass string and the middle string and not the melody string. I try to avoid that as much as possible so that the melody doesn't get chopped up into itsy bitsy pieces. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Da da dum. And then I come right back in. In the B part, it happens here. At the end of these little three note phrases, two, three, four, it hangs out for about a beat or so. So I like to add a little chug, a little couple of eight notes on the bass and on the middle string. There's a lot of space right there to add some of those little eight note chugs at the end. The rest of the song doesn't need it. It's a very, very active melody with a very, very active rhythm. But when everything feels like it just comes to a dead stop, it's a great time to add a little something something on the bass and on the middle string. there I added a little bit of some extra stuff going on there. You can get as fancy as you want with the noter, and that includes not just playing on the melody string, but also playing on the middle string and on the bass string. 
The key to doing this is to, first of all, make sure that you and your noter are well acquainted and you know the surface area of the tip of the noter so that you can be very good at targeting that middle string when you want to. I opened up this uh, episode with John Henry and there are a couple of moments there where I came over on the middle string to hit that B at the first fret. It can be tricky. This is not a noter that has a real big surface area. But whatever noter you have, if you practice by going over to that middle string, you'll get very, very uh, good at targeting that. Now, a couple things that'll happen um, when you're trying to work up that targeting and that accuracy. One is if you don't tip the noter just ever so slightly more to reach that note, you're gonna end up laying it against the melody string. And of course, with that melody string vibrating, it's gonna buzz. So you'd wanna make sure that when you go for that middle string or even the bass string, that you tilt the noter and that might even make it a bit more difficult for you to target because you have actually effectively reduced the surface area that's gonna be in contact with the string, which at that point, if you know you're not gonna play just on the melody string, you might want to invest in a noter that has a wider circumference or a rounder, larger circumference um, to make sure that you can get those middle notes when you reach for them and the bass notes. With the bass string, it's very, very difficult because not only do you have to go over there and try and grab that string, but you also have to tilt the noter even more to avoid hitting not just the melody string, but the middle string as well. So you might get some buzzing when you first attempt that. And you might at that point think, why am I using a noter if I'm gonna play on all three strings? At which point you'll simply use your fingers and put this away for a little bit. But think about it and try working with that. A good exercise for that is just doing what I did across the first uh, fret, is to come in, play open on the melody string, and then put your noter down, hit that note, and then hit your middle string open, and then hit the noter, and then hit your bass string open, and then put the noter down right there. And then just work through those and work on your targeting. And then try that all up and down the fretboard. Each one of these is going to require a different combination of movements from your hand, your wrist, your arm, all the way up to your shoulder. As you move further up the fretboard, you'll find yourself having to kind of twist and move and angle. But every single time you do that, through practicing, you will be developing muscle memory to the point where you can be quite, quite effective with the wooden dowel, the noter itself. So that's about it, playing with a noter. It's a lot of fun, especially if you are playing, uh, you know, at uh, reenactments or historical societies where you want to be as authentic and as, you know, pre-1840 as possible to get yourself a quill and to get yourself a noter and play like that. It just sounds real cool too, and it can be quite liberating. And if your fingers are really hurting, it is quite simply the ticket. So thank you guys very much for tuning in. I hope this has been helpful, and there will be a lot more coming up in the next few weeks as I've been home for a little bit and I can work in the studio and 
produce some new content for you. If you're interested in all kinds of this stuff, videos, tablature, musical downloads to help you in your mountain dulcimer journey, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash bingfutch. Just $5 a month gets you everything I've ever produced and everything I produce every single week as well. Make sure you go check out the featured tag section, click on open house and download to your heart's content. And think about joining this wonderful community of people who support what I do and are a part of my art every day. Patrons, I love you guys very much. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next week.